This is 332, analyzing control messages. So last time you did 331 where you were analyzing address resolution. Now we're analyzing different types of internet stuff here. So internet control messages, what are these? So the control layer, as you're reading through this, uh, once a host knows the destination address of another host, it needs to find the network route to it. So last time you figured out, oh, here's the MAC address and tying the IP address. Now you need to find the network route through it. So it's how do you actually go through the network to get there? So that picture from 331 was was looking like, let's, let's see what they showed you. They gave you stuff like this, or ugh, it's not there. It's down here, like as a magic network, right? And you can find MAC addresses and IP addresses on here. Maybe this is like just a network with a switch. But sometimes like that's this type of network. What if you, as you're going through the whole internet, you, not just knowing where the address is, but what's the what's the path to get there? So here's what this looks like. We we can use something called trace route to actually kind of trace where the packets have to go. And there's some really good diagrams in here that kind of show this. So let's say you want to get a message from like this computer X all the way to one of these computers over here. And then you have to figure out how to route it through the different routers. Each of these circles is a router. Well, one thing that um, computers do, like, how many routers are you going to have to jump to? And this is one of the challenges. Like, you want to know, you don't want to just send a message out and, like, just have it just search forever on the Internet. You, like, you, you want messages to kind of find the best route and tell you how long it gets there. And if it doesn't find the message, you want it to die. So what they what packets have they have this thing called time to live TTL. So the way this works is it's basically hey after this many router hops if it doesn't find out where it is just go back it didn't work. And and the way that they'll do this is they'll start and say hey the time they'll start at a time to live of 1 and if it doesn't find it and this router doesn't know then it comes back. And if that one comes back, it just increments that by one every time until it actually finds a destination. This is just so like messages, you know, why not go to like six, you know, have a hundred messages first thing and then come back. Well, they don't want to do that just because like stuff might take a long time to come back. And this is just kind of a, a more efficient system. So what it does, it bounce back, says one, it's not enough. And then it'll try, hey, we'll bounce here and it says time to live is two. And then is that, an, and then so two, and then it goes to this one, one, it says, oh, that's not enough, go back. And then if your TTL is three, it go boom, 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 but that's not quite because I die here. And then if TTL go to four, boom, 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 and boom, and you'll actually get to your router. So then you can reply and say, this is how to get to it. You got to go through routers A, B, and C, and then get to here. Now in the real world, there might be all sorts of routers, and they're all spider web together. So it's not, oh, always a linear path. It might be different routers from here. We're just trying to keep it simple right here. So just so you know, this TTL, time to live, is a key way we make sure packets are, information is going around the internet, but it doesn't just travel for every, forever. So we're going to be tracing this and learning how uh, you can hack things with this or how you can disrupt internet traffic. So we've launched the security lab right here. All right, step number one. Open up ICP this thing. Okay, so go to activities, go in the 332 folder, and oh, can you see that? What's wrong? Oh, hold on. I did this last time too. I want to do this so you can see it like that, right? And then let me refresh every time. So we're going to go open up that folder and open up the uh, Wireshark capture. There we go. We'll open up this trace route, Wireshark capture. And you're used to this by now. Uh, do I really want to go that big? Yeah, I'll do it. That's fine. In the Wireshark capture, examine the first packet in the packet list pane. Wireshark recognizes the packet type as an ICMP echo host request. Record the source and destination. So that'd be the first packet 
and my source it says in source right up here it goes 192.168 100 138 and your destination which is this column right here for the first packet is 4221 okay now examine the packet details pane that's this one in the middle expand internet protocol version 4 which is this one and look at time to live so ttl right your time to live and that value is one what is the ttl value yes i figured it out right so in the details the time to live for that packet is one awesome now examine the second packet in the packet list pane boom this guy the message is has a time to live the message is a time to live exceeded error because the route cannot be found in the destination host ip address so this is a ping, try to send it out, and time to live is one. It didn't make it, so this is the return information or return packet that says, oh, we didn't make it. Color code, the coloring rule for this packet indicates an ICMP error to see what other colors mean. Okay, so that's like the color coding in here. So the black means, so it's ICMP, and the black means it was an error. Okay, I can follow that. I don't care what other coloring rules. What's the meaning of a TTL value of 225? So it's TTL of 225. That means 225 jumps. So ICMP can attempt a maximum 225 hops before reporting the error. So it's giving it more chances to like come back to the router it's supposed to. All right, for reporting errors. Okay, cool. Why wouldn't it just need the same amount of jumps? I don't know. Maybe that's how the errors and just maybe it has to route differently to get back to its host. So they try to maximize it, I guess, in case network traffic's different on the way back. Record the address of the reply message and compare them to the request address. Okay, so the reply message source was 192.168.100.1 and the destination was 192.168.100.138. Um, let's comparing it. So this destination matches the source from the first ones, which makes sense. But this source had a different destination right here. So it wanted to find 4221, but it only made it to this address. And that's where it ran out of time. So 198.168.100, and then it bounced back. So that was going to say, conclude that this is a router. Destination host is not... 192.68.101 and TTL has been exceeded so far. The destination has reached. This device must be a router. Yeah, so that's probably, this is a computer on the network, the 138, and this is like your router at home. It's probably address one. That's what, like if this was at a home computer. The next two pairs of frames repeat this ping error message using the same TTL value of one. So the next two use the same value of one. Verify their redundant messages by observing the TTL and source the ICMCP. So trace route repeats the message so that temporary failures anomalies. So maybe it, so I know that diagram, you know, I did it once and then it goes up to two, but in reality, just in case there was some other weird thing that happened, it just tries the one twice before it goes up to two. Okay, makes sense. You never know what happens, like packets get lost in the internet. Now you will set up a useful scrolling feature in Wireshark to more easily compare values between packets. Select the first packet in packet list. Okay, so the first packet. Select its time to live entry in packet details. Scrolling feature in Wireshark. Okay, I want to compare. And then use the down arrow key to scroll through the list. Go like this. Wait. Um, wait, okay, let's do this again. Select the first packet in packet list. That'd be this guy. And select this time to entry in packet. That'd be this one. And use the down arrow key to scroll through the obs list observing a TTL value. I guess 1 through 48. Oh, okay, so then you do this and you go... Wait. Oh, okay, so if I've select... Wait a minute. Oh, that's it. Okay, so you have to select back up there. Notice it's um going up. So it's I guess that's an easy way to like go through this list and see how that keep it highlighted. 
Oh, so it's going up to three and then three, four, four. And notice that error is kind of getting small. The time to live for the returns are getting smaller too. Huh. So starts at one, increments by one up to eight. So I guess if I kept doing this, let's see, I keep doing this. And then it goes to eight. Is that it? Uh, every three packets. Okay, time to the value re varies from 248 to 255. Values indicate the number of hops the host has been exceeded. As you move from router to router, you build your trace route path. So notice, yeah, we'll, we have different IP addresses. This is the trace route path. Now look at the ICMP request in packet 49. What is the time to live value? That would be nine. Oh, notice I don't have any of the black ones after that. That means there's no error messages. Exa examine the ICP reply in step 50. TTL was not exceeded. What does this indicate? So time to live was not exceeded. What's that indicate? I found the host. And you can even see that there's the IP address for the destination or in the source. Boom, right there. Host was found and replied with the ICP. PMP reply packet. Furthermore, 56 hops between the source and the destination hosts. 56 hops. Oh, weird. So, like, it took nine hops to get there, but then this packet that came back had to, like, do that same pattern, but it took it 56 hops to come back. Huh. So, I guess that's one of those things with the internet traffic. You're not necessarily always going to come back in the same path. And it might not find that path. Huh. Cool. But you can see it took 56 hops to come back. Back at the top of the packet list, scan the list to identify and document all the unique routers the ICMP attempted, including the one that provided the reply. Must be at least 10. Okay, so let's do the whole list. So we start at router 1 was this one. And router 2, so this would be the... One that it's probably going to be all these ones that replied. So router two should be the 12, 180, 241, 1, and like step eight right here. And then I think the next router is going to be this one 12, uh, 153, 21, 202. And the next one's going to be this one here 12, 86, 61, 157. The next one's this one. So 12, 122, 133, 110. The next one's down here. 12, 122, 133, 137. Oh, yeah, there's less than 10, definitely. Next one's this one. 192, oops. 192, 1. Oh, wait, 205, 33, 210. And the next one's this uh, 468, 101, 162. Okay, and then the last one, which is what we got to, 4221, which is our goal. So that's, you know, it's after the ninth step, right? That's where it found it. And that's our path of IP addresses. So we've routed the path. These are the IP. Ad it had to go through these routers to get to our destination. That's the host. Or we had the original, which was 192.168.100.138, going through all these routers, and this is where it was trying to go. Cool. How can I trace route? Help a network administrator. Okay, well, you know where things are going. That's good. Now it might be useful for attacker, so you figure out, I would say... Uh, it's, you know, where, what computers in the network or routers are vulnerable, where if you want to capture the information, you have a lot of options on that route. What do you think would happen if a router along the path was configured to ignore these kinds of messages? So if a router was ignoring these kind of messages, I, I guess it couldn't go, traffic couldn't go through that router it would have to find a different path if it's trying to use trace through and pass through those routers. It's it's going to be blocked. So if what would happen if a router along that path was configured to ignore 
that would just be blocked in that path, you'd have to find another path. All right. Our next thing is we're going to talk about Smurf attacks. So what is a Smurf attack? And if you play this video at home, the idea is that in normal internet, you have this ping. You're, this is you right now. You are pinging other, another computer. So it goes in the internet and a lot of routers to get to this computer. And then it replies and say, hey, this is where I am. So just like a trace route ping. Same idea. You found the computer. Now the hacker man comes in. So what they can do is they can send this ICMP attack to all these computers. And what it'll do is those computers reply. So this guy is sending a message out trying to say, hey, where you are, but he's saying that his uh, his IP address is actually this victim computer. So the idea is you send this message or you send this message to a bunch of computers and say, hey, I want to know who you are. Like, it's yeah, and then it's like sending someone a bunch of pizzas. Say hey, I and like it's like swatting people in a way, I guess, but a little bit not as you know, like you're not getting your house knocked down, but you basically a lot got a lot a bunch of people prank calling you maybe. Maybe it's like a prank call. They're just posting that number online somewhere, and a bunch of people just call. You get overwhelmed. So if you have a bunch of computers trying to reply to this computer at the same time this computer can get overwhelmed, especially if they just keep doing that. So that's, and then what happens, things get overwhelmed, you get this denial of service attack because the server computer just halts internet traffic, it's overwhelmed. So that's smurfing. So what we'll do in this activity is try to see what smurfing looks like on Wireshark in the internet activity. So close that Wireshark, open up this one that says smurf. And here's some internet traffic. Display only the packets with the ICMP protocol. So how do you do that? I believe, go ICMP, right? Ah, that worked. And the filter, I assume that works. Yeah, cool. How do I do that? I'll say right into the name of the protocol in lowercase in the filter box, there you go. So you see only those. Uh, playing the role of the system admin for the this host, what do I see? So I am this host. What I'm seeing is a bunch of packets, a ton of packets. Really? I can't even scroll through all those. I am seeing a ton of packets. What's the bottom of this list? How do I get to it? I just hit end. Oh my gosh. Uh -huh, there's a lot of packets. Now, I mean, this is this is what's really going on. So I see a bunch of sources that are 8888 from 8888 trying to send this ping request to the source computer. So many, I don't even know how far it goes down. Is that what I'm supposed to see? I'm going to look up spoilers to make sure I'm not missing something here. Yeah, there's a bunch of echoed ping requests, and there's no responses to these ping requests. That's what you're supposed to see. And if you click on one of these, yep, ping requests, no responses. So find the fully qualified domain name for the source machine. So domain name, that would be um, 888. How do I do that? You need to use a command line tool to find the fully qualified domain name. Uh, okay. So, how are we going to do that? Um, so, we have to find that source. So, what do we do? Let's look up that source. Who is 8? 8.8.88? Who is that? Oh, I probably don't want to go to some random place. Let's not do that. Who? So, IP lookup. What is my IP? At? Okay, I think you can do something like How do you how do you do this? Let's hold on. So you can go who is eight 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 eight. Okay, so that's kind of how you do. So what is my what is eight 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 eight? That is a Google public DNS domain name. So that belongs to Google. So yeah, you have to actually look that you can look that stuff up. So how do you look up? An IP address, that would be one way to do this. Oh, they mentioned a command line thing. 
I'm sure there's other ways you can do this. So if you did in here, I think we can do this. And we can go, isn't it like eight? There might be some other command. No, I think it's like, do I do that? Oh, okay, I'm wrong. Someone else, when you do this activity, why don't you just put that in comments if you have a better way of getting this. What it says in the answer guide right here, it says, students will need to perform this search on their Cloud9 account. And I'm like, what Cloud9 account? I don't have one. But it says, hey, you find it, and you find out it's google.com. So that's a Google domain. So it belongs to Google. It's Google. Okay, find the fully qualified domain name for the source machine. And you need to use command line tool. The domain name is this long thing that was in there. That one, Google public DNS. Do I recognize the source? Someone is trying to attack the source host by spoofing. ICMP message appears though it asks for all those pings. So it's trying to like pretend that it's Google. Ask Google right here and asking for those pings. Okay. How many packets were sent from the source to the host amount of time? So how many packets is this? Oh, I, there's got to be a way to count this, right? I don't know how to count this at all. A ton. If I do an all. Oh, do I have to do? I don't know how to count these. It's got to be like, oh, yeah, packets right here, 84,000. That's what I would say. Yeah. So you say here, it's, it's in here, the detail, displayed, oh, displayed packets. There are in here 81,602 packets. And approximately how many packets were sent from the source and in what amount of time? So what you can do for time is... Oh, the scrolling works. We can see like the bottom of the list and the top of the list. So if we go, I think we can get to the very top. This is not an efficient way of doing this. So you can't use that scroll very well. So I think this tells me it was in basically almost half a second 578 milliseconds is that what i'm looking for that actually be my correct answer uh no that's not my correct answer so i'm going to figure this out okay so we just have to find these sort these pings right here so we have to keep going from the first ping up here i want to move my cursor to the very top Oh wait, can I move? Am I just at the bottom right now? Or might be at the bottom. So you gotta you gotta go all the way to the first one of these. I'm closer to this, and then we will go to the last one. There's gotta be a better. Okay, I don't. Sometimes like. Ah, oh, come on. Sometimes there's gotta be a better way to scroll to the bottom. Oh, this is terrible. Nope. Few. Oh, I feel really. First packet. Control. Oh, there we go. There's the first packet. <laughs> and the last packet. So here, and then control. End. So I can go to the last packet. Control plus end. Okay. So you have this time 10. I'm going to put a calculator my screen and we're going to write this down we're going to go 10.037840 oh, and we're actually going to subtract the one at the very top so I'm going to go to the first packet and we can see this first bad one so we're subtracting this so I'm going 12.896863 so I know that's subtracted, but it's a difference there. So 2.85 seconds 
is what this happened in. So two point. So basically, you had 81,000 packets in a in a little less than three seconds, and and that's why systems get overwhelmed. Are you suspicious? Yeah, that's pretty suspicious of repeating the same thing that many times from one source, especially a source like Google. And that might not make sense. So this would be what we call a Smurf attack. The source responds to each of these ICMP messages. They're pretending they're from Google, but kind of hacked you there. So close and disconnect the security lab. So question you ask, how could a large number of hosts with no login access be used in a Smurf attack? Uh, with no login access. Well, it's just hackers kind of get access to them. So uh, the in conclusion here, they're going to, you might think, well, how do computers protect against this? If anyone could just pretend that go sends a message out and say, hey, yeah, go, I, go attack this guy. Uh, how, how they protect against it? The routers can put that. Uh, the solution is older routers might just allow this kind of traffic, but newer routers can protect routers from ICMP attacks or just ICMP traffic. I'm guess I'm guessing, and I, I guess this happened in like one of the early units. We talked about adding this to our firewall, where our home routers maybe we don't want this kind of traffic coming through our router, so we prevent it. And that's it. Thank you for watching.